So an important question is how many species of bacteria and archaea are out there? Uh, the answer is it's very difficult to have an accurate number because of the way in which we go about describing new species. Uh, upon a time, one of the best ways to find bacteria was to culture them, was to take a sample from the environment or from uh, an affected organism, if you were trying to find the cause of a, an agent of disease, a causal agent, uh, and you would culture it. You put it on a petri plate and see if it grew. And if it did grow, you could try and get into a pure culture so it was all by itself, there weren't any other species, just one single species on that plate. And as it turns out, there are a large number of uh, archaea and bacteria that are not culturable. They will not grow uh, in isolation, they won't grow on petri plates for any of a number of reasons. Uh, just like there are a number of animals that are not domesticable. Uh, you're not going to go out and find a, a, a salamander and teach it to do tricks for you. Uh, bacteria work the same way. They don't necessarily uh, want to perform for us, so they won't necessarily grow uh, in, uh, in culture plates. So how do we know? If we can't culture them, how do we know these bacteria are out there? Uh, well, one way in which we know that they are out there is through a process called metagenomic prospecting. And what metagenomic prospecting is, uh, it's a way of taking an environmental sample, and instead of culturing it, what we do is we take out uh, all the DNA. We extract all the DNA that we can from that environmental sample, and then we use some biochemical tests, like the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and we amplify all of a particular gene region from that environmental sample. And when we amplify that gene region, it's kind of like collecting fingerprints, because each organism has its own signature uh, sequence of nucleotides for a particular gene, like, for example, the 16S ribosomal DNA. So we can take all of the DNA out of a sample, it's like an example of ocean water or soil, and count the number of fingerprints that we get uh, and see how many different ones there are. And when we do this, we find that the number of uh, unique fingerprints is mind-boggling. Uh, in a handful of soil, we could find as many as 10,000 different fingerprints, 10,000 different species of prokaryotes uh, existing in just a very, very small amount of uh, material. Uh, that said, we can consider a little bit of the diversity of the prokaryotic lineages, the archaea and the bacteria, and you can see here, as I've been saying, that uh, prokaryotes are not a taxon. We want taxa to be, we want taxa to be clades. Meaning, if we want to form a taxon, we want to be able to cut the tree, the phylogeny, in one spot and have everything and only the things that we want to fall out. So one nice clean cut and everything falls out. So we can do that for the archaea. We can cut the tree right here. We exclude bacteria, we exclude eukarya, and we get just this lineage with these four branches here. And that's the well-defined domain archaea. <clears throat> Similarly, we can do the same thing with eukaryotes. We can make one nice clean cut right here, and we have a domain eukarya. Uh, same with bacteria. We can make one nice clean cut right here, and only the bacteria branches would fall out. But if we wanted to cut, make one cut, and have only prokaryotes fall out, well, it's not fair to just cut the tree here, 
because you have to include all of the descendants of a single common ancestor. So here's our universal ancestor. And we make one cut that includes all of the descendants of that ancestor and only the descendants of that ancestor. Not in a way that we can exclude eukaryotes and keep the archaea and bacteria together. So in the domain archaea, uh, we can argue about how many kingdoms there are. But for the ease uh, of our learning for this semester, we're just going to say there's one. We're going to call it the kingdom archaebacteria. There are definitely four discrete, well-substantiated lineages within the archaea, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, and I just showed you in the previous slide. Uh, archaea, our archaea bacteria, are gram-negative. Uh, they do not take the gram stain. But the reason that they don't take the gram stain is because they don't have peptidoglycan at all. They don't have that sandwich uh, they don't actually have peptidoglycan at all. So they are, uh, they have that shared characteristic of being, of not ex uh, absorbing gram stain, but uh, because of homoplasy. Uh, gram negative bacteria typically have peptidoglycan, but they have that extra layer on the outside, that membrane layer that it prevents them from absorbing the stain. In the case of archaea, they don't have peptidoglycan, which is why they don't absorb the stain. Uh, they have something called pseudopeptidoglycan. The most famous archaebacteria are extremophiles, meaning they love extreme conditions. Maybe they love extreme heat, and they're thermophiles. Or they love extremely salty conditions, and they are halophiles. And by extreme salt, I mean even saltier than uh, ocean water. Ocean water is about 3.5% uh, salt by weight to volume. Uh, halophiles can tolerate up to 9% or almost three times as salty as ocean water uh, conditions. Uh, acidophiles can grow at very very low pH. Remember very low pH means a very highly acidic condition. Uh, there are also archaeans that are methanogens, meaning they give rise to, they generate methane. <coughs> Methane, uh, methanogens are strict anaerobes. They do not grow in the presence of oxygen. Uh, they produce methane gas, uh, also called swamp gas, although the swampy smell that you may be familiar with is from hydrogen sulfide, not from methane. Methane is odorless. Uh, but methanogens are important because they are decomposers. They can take uh, sources of carbon. Uh, from dead and decaying matter and recycle it, turn it into something that other organisms can use. Now, in addition, we know that there are some non-extreme archaea out there. So here are four lineages of the archaea, the core archaeotes, the uriarchaeotes, crenarchaeotes, and the nanoarchaeotes. Uh, the majority of known Archaeans are in the Eurarchaeota. Uri is a prefix that means broad, reflecting that. Uh, this includes methanogens, extreme halophiles. It's, it's the biggest uh, branch in terms of the number of species. Uh, the Crenarchaeota. Cren comes from a, a Greek word that means spring, like a, a, a spring for a body of water. Uh, because many of these organisms are found near uh, hot springs where they are heated, uh, springs that are heated by the Earth's um, core. The core archaeota uh, are also found in hot springs. Uh, kor koros means young man. Uh, this is one of the most, the, the newest lineages that have been found for uh, Archaeans. Uh, the nanoarchaeota, uh, nano means dwarf, and it's also a prefix we use that means billionth, uh, like a nanosecond is a billionth of a second, uh, but nano means dwarf. Uh, and nanoarchaeota are some of the smallest cells that have been 
uh, found in nature, they can be only a third of a micron in size, which is teeny, uh, in, even for a cell. <clears throat> and nanarchaeota were originally found as parasites of other archaeotes. So they found uh, a species of crenarchaeota that had this cell that apparently was piggybacking on it, uh, and it turns out it was one of these nanarchaeotes that was uh, parasitizing uh, its fellow Archean. Uh, for the bacteria, uh, this is a very simplified phylogeny. There are a lot more types of bacteria out there, uh, but these are the most familiar types. Uh, we talked about gram-positive. Uh, gram-positive bacteria form a monophyletic, holophyletic lineage. So all of them, the gram-positives, are found here. So if a bacterium accepts the gram stain and turns purple, we know that it is a member of this clade, this uh, group that includes all um, descendants from a common ancestor. Uh, cyanobacteria are photosynthetic. Uh, spirochetes and chlamydias are most famous for uh, being pathogenic, but there are a number of other non-pathogenic species in there as well. And then the proteobacteria are very, very diverse, uh, so much so that we usually divide them into uh, smaller groups based on uh, Greek letters of the alphabet. So how many kingdoms within bacteria? Again, just to keep things simple, we're going to say there's the kingdom eubacteria, or, or sometimes people just say the kingdom bacteria. Uh, and that'll be our our kingdom, just the one kingdom within the domain bacteria. But the diversity uh, is very, very complex. So within the proteobacteria, you can see we've got several lineages, several clades. We've got the alpha subgroup, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon subgroups, uh, which include things like this uh, mutualistic uh, rhizobium, bacteria. Rhizobium is a genus of bacteria that has a mutualistic relationship with our leguminous plants. Leguminous plants are within the family Fabaceae, uh, and that includes all of our peas and our beans. Uh, acacia trees are also in that family. Uh, it is a very, very large family, and uh, this uh, Mutualism is very important to us because uh, members of the Fabaceae, the, the pea family, forming these relationships with rhizobium and other type closely related bacteria are able to fix nitrogen. So they can take environmental atmospheric nitrogen and they can convert it into uh, forms of nitrogen that can be used for making things like proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, this is something that we absolutely depend upon for uh, getting our nitrogen and our nitrogenous bases and other forms of uh, bioavailable nitrogen. And this is part of the reason why uh, peas and beans are so are, are good. Uh, plant-based sources of protein. So that's just one of the species within the alpha subgroup. Uh, Nitrosomonas uh, is also very important in the nitrogen cycle in how uh, nitrogen uh, is made available to other organisms. Excuse me. Uh, Thiomargarita namibiensis uh, is found off the coast of southern Africa by the nation of Namibia. And its claim to fame is that it is one of the largest uh, prokaryotic cells. It's um, almost 750 microns in size. Other than that, uh, fairly unremarkable. 